In the last tutorial, I showed you the basics of shaders, so now let's take a look at textures. Textures can be one-dimensional, two-dimensional, or three-dimensional, but in this tutorial, we'll only look at the two-dimensional textures as they are the most common type of texture. So the first thing we'll want to do is to import an image into our program so that we can make it into a texture and display it. In order to do that, we're going to use this popular open source library called STB. To install it, go to your project folder, then libraries, and then include. Now create a folder named STB, and inside of it create a text file named STB underscore image dot text. Now go to the link I left in the description, press Ctrl A to select everything, and then copy paste it into the text file we've just created. Make sure to save it, and then rename it to STB underscore image dot H. Now, create a CPP file named stb.cpp in your project source files and write the following into it so that we'll only use the things we need from this library. Now, right click the CPP file and click on compile. Make sure to only do this once. That's it. Now, if you want to use the library, simply include the header file into the file you want to use it in. I'll do that in the main.cpp file. Now, before we get to the texture, let's make sure we have the coordinates for a square so that we can better see our texture when displayed. Don't forget to also change your indices and the glDrawElements function. Run your program to make sure you do indeed get a square. If everything is all right, then let's import our image in. Keep in mind that square textures in PowerSoft 2 such as 1024 by 1024 pixels or 2048 by 2048 pixels are better optimized than textures with a random number of pixels, so do try to make them fit this format. I'll be using this image of Popcat that's 512 by 512 pixels, which I'll put into a textures folder in resource files. Don't forget to also put the image in your project's main folder. First, we have to create three integer variables to sort the width and height of the image in pixels and the number of color channels it has. Then, we'll store the image itself in an unsigned character array named bytes using the function stbi underscore load and giving it the location and name of the image, the pointers of the variables we created, and zero. That's it for importing it in. Easy, right? Now, let's create the texture object itself. Just like any OpenGL object, we'll first create a reference variable of type GLUINT and name it texture. Now, just use GLGENTextures to generate the texture object, giving it the number of textures you want, one in our case, and the pointer to the reference variable. Since we've created it, we also want to delete it at the end of the main function. We now need to assign the texture to a texture unit. You can think of texture units as slots for textures that come together as a bundle. These generally hold about 16 textures and allow the fragment shader to work with all 16 textures at the same time. To insert our texture in the slot of a texture unit, we simply need to activate the texture unit we want using GL Activate Texture, plugging in the index of the texture unit, and then binding our texture with GL bind texture, inserting the texture type and its reference value. Since we now have our texture binded, that means that this would be a good time to adjust its settings to our liking. First, we'll have to choose how we want our image to be processed when scaled up or down. We can choose GL nearest, which keeps all the pixels as they are. This is preferred when working with pixel art, or we can choose GL linear, which creates new pixels according to the pixels nearby. This generally results in a blurrier image. Which one you choose depends on your needs in a certain context. For now, I'll just go with GL nearest. I'll use the GL text parameter I function to tweak our texture settings and input the type of our texture, the setting we want to modify, and the value we want to give our setting. I'll modify both the mean filter and mag filter settings. Now the second setting is how we want our texture to be repeated. We can choose between GL repeat, GL mirrored repeat, GL clamp to edge, and GL clamp to border. The first one simply repeats the image. The second one repeats the image but mirrors it every time it repeats it. The third one stretches the borders of the image and the last one simply puts a flat color of your choice outside the image. 
Note that you can mix and match them since they only apply on one axis. So you could have the texture repeat on the vertical axis, but only have a flat color on the horizontal axis. These axes are named STR, corresponding to the common X, Y, and Z axes. Just like before, we'll use GL text parameter I, plugging in the texture type, the setting we want to modify, and the value of our setting. Make sure to do this for both the S and T axes. If you want to use GL clamp to border, you'll have to also use GL text parameter FV, plugging in the texture type, GL texture border color, and the color of the border, which should be an array of three or four floats. Now that our settings are complete, we can generate the texture using GL text image 2D and inputting the following. The type of texture, zero. The type of color channels we want the texture to have, the width, the height, zero. This is just the legacy leftover thing. The type of color channels our image has, the data type of our pixels, and the image data itself. The most common types of color channels are GLRGB and GLRGBA. The first one is for JPEGs and the second one is for PNGs. If you want to look at all the types of color channels and pixel data types, I left a link in the description to the OpenGL documentation. If at the end of this tutorial you get an error during compiling, then it might be because you specify the wrong type of color channels or a pixel data type for reading your image. Since we've already imported the image data into the texture, we'll want to delete the data using STBI image free and also unbind the texture so we don't accidentally do something to it. The last thing you'll want to do after that is to use the GL generate MIP map function, plugging in the data type of the texture. This will generate the MIP maps for the texture, which are just smaller resolution versions of the same texture that are used when the texture is far away, for example. Great, we have the texture, but we did not specify how we want the texture to be mapped on the vertices. So let's do that now by adding coordinates to our vertices. The coordinates of the texture go from 1 to 0 on both axes, starting from the bottom left corner. If you would give coordinates higher than 1, then the texture will be repeated such as in this example. Now that we've modified our vertices, we also need to add a new layout to our vertex shader and make sure to modify our vertex buffer object. Since the fragment shader deals with colors, we need to export the texture coordinates to the fragment shader and import them like so. The last thing we need to do in the fragment shader is to create a uniform of type sampler 2D, call it text 0, then equal the frag color to the function texture which takes text 0 and text coordinates as inputs. The uniform tells OpenGL which texture unit it should use. So in the main function, create a uniform just like in the shaders tutorial and assign the uniform the index of our slot, 0 in this case. Make sure to do this after you've activated the shader program. The last thing we need to do is to bind the texture object in the main function and we're done. If you press run, you should see a majestic texture appear on your square. But wait, it's upside down. Well, that's because OpenGL reads images from the bottom left corner to the top right corner, while STB reads them from the top left corner to the bottom right corner. So all we have to do to fix this is to write STBI set flip vertically on load true before we load in the image file. To wrap it all up, I will create a custom texture class just like in tutorial number 4. Don't forget to add comments to everything you've written so that you can make sure you understand what's happening. The source code and some exercises to test your knowledge are in the description as always. Bye!